Hello, this is the RPG Pundit, the final boss in Internet Shitlords. And today I'm doing my overview, review, whatever you want to call it, of Sword and Caravan. It's not really a review because, of course, I wrote this game. But I wanted to give you guys a step-by-step -step view of the whole book. People have been asking me for it. They've been, they've been buying it like crazy. It's been super, super successful in the first month. And here is your chance if you're still kind of... Uh, undecided if you don't know what it's what's in it i'm you're gonna get to see it all today <laughs> all right so sword and caravan historical setting for osr games by rpg prundit it's published by mad scribe press um you can see it's very nice this is the soft cover edition but there's also a hard cover edition which is really beautiful and it's exactly the same except for the hard cover i'm just using the soft cover because it's easier to to page through um it's 190 pages of book um, and it says here, it's an OSR setting book for playing a historically accurate fantasy campaign set in the East along the region known as the Silk Road at the turn of the 12th and 13th centuries. This timeline is set amidst the turbulent era between the Third Crusade and the Mongol invasions. This marked Europe's earliest period of post-classical interaction with the East. Uh, as players, you can be crusaders, merchants, or explorers traveling to ancient and mysterious lands. Alternatively, you may choose from any number of unique character concepts native to these lands. Um, there's a detailed gacheteer of each region, which you will see, new classes and magical techniques, guidelines on mechanics, on commerce, social interaction, law and justice, a historically accurate bestiary, magic items inspired by myths and legends of every culture in the region, abundant adventure seeds that you can use to hook players, random tables and generators to help create encounters with an authentic world feeling. Okay? So, uh... That's actually a really good description of everything you get in here. Um, this is Sword and Caravan is the Silk Road from the 1190s to the 1220s. It is not a, a fantasy world based on the Silk Road. It's not. It, it's it's. Um, it is it is actually the authentic medieval period, right? And so it has all of those pretenses, same as you know Dark Albion and Lion and Dragon have. Um, you can see that the interior is just fantastic. The layout, the borders, the artwork, it's all top quality. Um, Silk Road campaign, a little bit of a description on the Silk Road campaign there. And here you have notes on setting and culture. So, uh, you know, you're... It, yeah, it, oh, it's a meatball that came charging out of nowhere. What's going on, me? Hey, what... What is what the heck is this? Are you choosing to interfere in the review? Do you have something to add? Were you going to talk about social status being a very important concept in the medieval period and how it, it the different slight differences in social status between the European concepts and the and the and the Middle Eastern ones? How about religion? You know, and how you know whether you're talking about Muslims, Buddhists, Jews, Christians, Taoists, Confucians, Magians, or Hindus. The people of this era, uh, the religion was a fundamental reality, right? And uh, religion is super important. You know, all of these concepts are very important to take into account. Magic, monsters, and miracles were based a, a known part of the real world in the Middle Ages. Uh, life is cheap. Morality, sexuality, and the role of women. So once again, just because this is a medieval set, authentic setting, I want to make it really clear to all potential new players. Those of you who've played... Lion and Dragon or Dark Albion, you'll know all this already, but there we are. So we start with a setting overview, and, and we take a look at the Crusader states, Acre and Antioch, Tripoli, Crack the Chevalier, Tyre. Um, lots of details about each of these cities. So if you're planning to do a Crusader campaign, you're in good stead there. The Kingdom of Saladin, where we get into detail about... Um, the, the territories that he controlled, the Seljuk Turks, who were the last big power before Saladin and are now in very, very rapid decline. The Khwarazmian, <laughs> this video will be good because you'll know how to pronounce things. Khwarazmian Shahs of Bukhara. So the, the, the Khwarazmian Shahs in the territory known as Khwarazm, um, it, these were uh, former vassals of the Seljuks that have now become very po powerful and they're located at the start of the Silk Road, just to the east of Baghdad, on the other side of the mountains, basically, from, from Baghdad. Um, 
the Gurids. They're an Indian sultanate that has expanded itself over um, over Persia and Pak and Afghanistan and you know what parts of India and, and what would, today would be Pakistan. Um, then there's the Liao, also known as the Karakatan, who were a, a tribe of, of barbarians that had at one point um, invaded parts of China and became Sinicized, you could say. They, they became Chinese cultured and now have uh, a, a, a kingdom in the Silk Road area. The Xia, another barbarian kingdom, um, originally known as the Tangut. Uh, and the Jin Dynasty, who are yet another barbarian kingdom. This is a, a repeated case here. There's there's a there's a cycle that I think might become obvious to you of barbarians invading the Chinese and then becoming Chinese themselves. You know, and finally the real Chinese, the Song. <laughs> there we go, the Song Dynasty at the end of the Silk Road. And I add in the Song Dynasty, which was, by the way, the most incredible civilization that existed up to the Industrial Age. Um, some of their incredible accomplishments. So you get stuff about the printing press and paper money. And uh, also you get their details on gunpowder and how they had landmines. Yes, the song had landmines in the 1190s. So what the heck has happened here? Come on now. Oh, there we go. And anyway, a little note about the Mongols. They're not really important. Right? <laughs> of course, if you check out the... the uh, the timeline at the in the in the later chapter, you'll realize that they're tremendously important. So here we have a huge, um, well, a two a two page one bar hex map in done in the ancient style, right? Like this is a this is not really accurate to scale in any way, but it's done in a medieval style that shows you the entirety of the Silk Road. And here we have a gazetteer circle, and every single one of these cities, the the ones in the center are the ones that are like on the Silk Road itself, and then you have um, important cities that are that that come that are united, linked by road or trail or something else to that city, right? So uh, you have all of this uh, route, you know, that you can that you can follow the main the main Silk Road, but you can also learn about all the cities that are kind of bordering the Silk Road and things that are there that are of interest, right? And there's various different routes that you can take along the Silk Road. So once you're done with the Third Crusade, or if you don't care about the Third Crusade, you can start traveling and wandering along the Silk Road. And so it starts from Acre and it ends in Langzhou in China. Um, and every, every area, even like little villages, have slight notes here. And you're going to see in this, ch in this um, chapter, there are going to be many of these wonderful gazetteer-style hex maps. Okay, and and we couldn't do one giant one because, well, you know, it would require a massive poster map or something like that, you know. Um, so we had to break it up into sections, right? So this is the Levant, basically, right? Here's like you get to have an accurate hex map in 1190 of in in the classic D and D style of the the Near East, right? The um, the Holy Land right? is Jerusalem, Cairo. Um, up here is Damascus. That's Damascus there, Homs. So you've got the whole the whole area of the Holy Land depicted for you. Um, and you know, any anything that's interesting that you that that has some potential for like making a city stand out or is useful for adventuring gets included in the details of each region, right? In each each town. Um, so here's another map. So here we've got, you know, uh, this is this is basically the Iraq region. You could say Baghdad and Tikrit there, and up north is Kirkuk and Mosul. So this is like this is the Kurdish lands. Which, by the way, uh, Saladin was not an Arab. Saladin was a Kurd. Very interesting detail there. Um, Ambar, you know, <laughs> these these are names that have become better known to people in the West in the last 20 years, right? Um, Anbar province and so on. And then we go further along into the areas of the Silk Road that nobody still, <laughs> that nobody in the West knows, except, you know, the very few of us who take some, some serious studies. And of course, the, the facts are that there's like places in the Silk Road at this time 
that just don't exist anymore. They stopped existing when you had um, Kangas Khan come charging through and slaughtering everything in its path. Right. So it's the, it's quite amazing, actually, some of the things that that are that are notable about um, the Silk Road in this period that are just completely forgotten, you know. Uh, I love some of their titles, right? So, like, um, there was a there was a city by Damgan that was called uh, the City of a Hundred Gates. You know, it's now a ruin um, because also, like, even at this ty- point in time, the Silk Road was already like fifteen hundred years old at the time of of uh, Richard Lionheart and Saladin and Kangas Khan. You know, uh, Nishapur, the perfect built city. You know, <laughs> that's a wonderful name. Um, and you know Nishapur had a population of eight hundred thousand people, just like remarkable population, and it wasn't even the biggest one. The biggest one was Merv, the mother of the world, right? Like that was the biggest city in the world at this time, and nobody remembers it anymore, or very very few people remember it anymore, um, basically because. You know, uh, it was completely, completely destroyed by Genghis Khan. So, uh, yeah, <laughs> more, more hex maps. I, I'm, not, I'm not kidding about how many hex maps we've got here. <laughs> you know, you get, you get a hex map, the hex map for every region you're going through. There's nothing that's skipped, right? So you can go from one map to the next as you're traveling along the Silk Road and explore all these areas. Yeah. You know? So I'm gonna just carry through here. I think you've gotten the idea of the. Um, of the gazetteer area, but you can see how long it is, right? It's it's like an important bulk part of the um, of the book, and it ends it, it ends in Jin China, you know. So it like goes the entire length. You go for you can travel, and there's details on every city and the entire length of the Silk Road. Here. New classes and powers. So this is stuff that is it's set up in the structure of Lion and Dragon. So if you're going to play a different game. Um, OSR game, you might have to do some slight adjustments, right? Or you might just want to use it whole hog because, you know, flail snail, right? Who, who gives a crap? It's all OSR. It works. It compa- it's compatible with itself, even if you don't adapt it, right? But there you go. So you got the Silk Rope Merchant here. You've got the Tribesman. You know, the, these are the, the non-civil, non-city dwelling. I was going to say civilized, but non-city dwelling Tribesmen that are... Uh, so important to travel in the desert. Um, so those are kind of a combo in a way. Then you have the Sufis. And so the Sufis are the Islamic mystics. So they get to be the equivalent in the Islamic world of the clerics. And I've given them some powers, which are just like the cleric miracles in Lion and Dragon are like the best, the most typical miracles performed by Christian saints. Um, that's how I chose the cleric miracles that I did in in uh, in Lion and Dragon, basically. In the in the Sufi class, the Sufis' um, miraculous abilities or wondrous powers are based on the Sufi stories and the most common wondrous powers that Sufis were said to manifest. Right, so bilocation is one of them. That's like that's super super common in, in Sufi stories. Right, exorcism, being able to free himself or other people from bonds, healing, levitation, locating an object or a person, creating food or drink, and reading people's minds. You know, so they they have a different list than the than the cleric gets in Lion and Dragon, but play a similar role in the the Islamic societies of the Silk Road. And then they have the Chinese Confucian Taoist or Buddhist sage. This isn't exactly a wizard, which causes a bit of uh, caused a bit of questions for some people. If you do want to play a magician, then they would be like just like the lion and dragon magister, but would have a different list of of magical techniques. Um, the sage is actually a Confucian or Taoist or Buddhist learned scholar who may or may not have any magic, and he may or may not know some martial arts, <laughs> uh, but he definitely has a lot of knowledge skills. You know, they have a lot of knowledge skills. Um, so the sages are um, extreme experts on 
all kinds of learning of all Chinese learning, right? Which is why some of them even know some magic or some, um, some martial arts. There are three new magical techniques for these, uh, for the, from this class. One is mudras, which are, um, gestures of the hands, you know, like, uh, different positions that you place your hands in to, to focus energy, to create different special effects. The second are charms. And I mean, if you've seen Kung Fu, like wuxia movies, you'll be familiar with these, right? Like the postures that the monks put their hands in when they're doing some kind of um, concentration of chi or, th or, or things like that. And then the charms are, you know, like those pieces of paper that have like the, the little um, talisman on it that like you slap them on a hopping vampire and it dies, right? That sort of thing. Well, that's what charms are. They're, they're very, they're one use um, sigil talismans made on paper that have different powerful effects, right? So these are these are interesting in in that um, you know in Lion and Dragon the Magister has very few powers that are that are really usable in the thick of of things, right? And then they do have some that are like permanent objects. I think like um, the Magister can create astrological talismans that are permanent. But it takes a long time and costs money to do it, right? So the, here the, the Chinese sages um, have magic that is not as powerful, but it, 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 it creates it can be it can be used cheaply, right? It's and you know it's it's a one use item, but it it's cheap and relatively fast to do, right? And then the Jing, which is uh, both the divination system the, of of China and the main cosmological guide to the universe and to you know space and time, so that uh, you know that when you take I Ching practices first and foremost, you learn how to perform just some divination, but then later you learn how to um, be able to obtain um, a greater understanding of of space and time, see into the past and the future, and then later just uh, become, you know, one with time, essentially. Uh, and then martial art techniques. So depending on whether you're Buddhist, uh, Taoist, or Confucian, you will learn one of three different martial art styles that you can, that can give you some bonuses. Next, we have monsters, um, animals, and opponents. So these are all based on Silk Road area mythology, right? They're all grounded in the the mythological aspects, let's say, of the uh, of the Silk Road. Um, some of them are from Arab mythology. Some of them are Indian or Persian. Some of them are Chinese. Some of them are Mongol or Uzbek or what have you. Um, Plus a few like, you know, you got your, your horses and stuff because those are camels. Those are very important. Um, amazing, amazing artwork still. Um, really, really nice section. Um, you also have the Jin, which are the most important sort of fairy race that exists in the Silk Road. Uh, and you also have somewhere around here, you have, the, I think we've already passed it. You have Assassins. Um, which are the, the fanatical Nazari Ismaili Muslim uh, super killers, <laughs> which, uh, you know, somebody said, well, why can't the assassin be a character class in the Silk Road? Well, you can play a normal hired assassin. That would be a thief class. There's nothing special about that, right? But the assassins, the, 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 the Ismaili fanatics that served the old man of the mountain, were just that they were like they their entire lives were dedicated to performing this one art they weren't just guys that wandered around in an adventuring party so it, it, to me it just doesn't i couldn't see how that would work you know like um they're i mean a dm could choose to do that i guess but it would be it, it would be um turning away from the fact th these guys were you know absolute they were basically just machines they were sleeper agents that did um that absolutely did whatever they were bid to do. And that was their mission, you know? So there you could have an assassin that's faking being an adventurer for a little while, but it would be like really shitty that you're like, I guess if you wanted to, if you're sort of like a juicer in rifts or something, you never know when your when your number is being called, right? Like at any moment, the old man of the mountain could send you the message that you have to go kill someone and then sacrifice your life doing it. And that's it for your character. But I don't see the point. Trade wealth and equipment. So there's lots of stuff here on the local currencies. 
price lists. Um, there are rules about slaves and the costs and, and managing purposes of slaves because, of course, slavery, uh, unlike some people seem to think it was like slavery was invented by Europeans in, what was it, 1619 or something like that. No, slavery has existed all across the Silk Road for all of its history. You know? <laughs> and uh, so it's a reality of the setting. It just is. Uh, trade goods, cost of living. So there's lots of rules for handling that sort of stuff. Because, of course, your characters might be, might even be merchants. You might be mercenaries that are working to protect a merchant uh, caravan. Um, but you might get into business yourself. So there's rules on handling big business. There's lists of what, are, what were the real taxes that existed along the Silk Road. And then, you know, gems and jewels, special treasures, magical herbs and potions. And now here we're getting into the magic items. These are descriptions of special magic items. And they're all items that are actually based on mythology and legends of the Silk Road, of different societies from the Silk Road. Next, we get into encounters along the Silk Road. And so you have your basic encounters along the road, um, special encounters that include all kinds of special events that can happen, details on the caravanserais, the, the coach houses that were like, a lot of them were like little fortresses and where a lot of the action happens if you're like a trader on the Silk Road. It's where you learn everything that's going on. A lot of times that's where you meet people that might have business for you of different kinds and it would be the same if you're adventurers. And then you have city encounter tables, uh, possible missions, employment tables, events in cities and regions. And there's like rules about when to check these sort of things too, right? So, uh, And then the unwanted attention rules, which are if you're – character lingers for too long in a city and depending on what they're doing they may end up getting in the attention the unwanted attention of the authorities or royal attention when some like ruler if you do really noteworthy shit a ruler might decide to pay attention to you and sometimes that's good like he might just offer you like some huge reward but then of course you owe him or it might be bad he might see you as a threat you know <laughs> so there's stuff on all that justice so here are the laws and punishment, the rules according to um, how Sharia law was applied in the um, Islamic part of the Silk Road and Chinese law, how that was applied, the, the Confucian Han Code, um, how that was applied, uh, including the list of the, uh, the ten abominations, which are the, the only the, – the Chinese were very pragmatic. A almost any crime – if you had enough money, you could pay a fine rather than suffer the, the consequence of that crime, except the 10 abominations. Those are 10 crimes that were death penalty crimes and that you couldn't, there was no bribe that would get you out of it, right? So uh, if you want to find out what those were, I guess you'll have to check out the book. <laughs> Survival rules for extreme cold and heat because, you know, in the desert it gets very cold at night, but also in the mountains, when there are mountains in, in the Silk Road, get really cold in the winter. And of course, heat, I think that would be a given, food and water, so stuff for starvation or dying of thirst. Then we get to the chronology of the Silk Road, which details the events that happen along the Silk Road and uh, the whole time between 1186 and... Twelve twenty-two. Sorry, twelve twenty-two. So that's a, a very lengthy period that you could theoretically be playing this campaign. And so, like you know, eleven the eleven nineties is eleven ninety is supposed to be like the starting date for the campaign, um, which is when the Third Crusade happens. And so you could play through the Third Crusade. Well, there was a there was a Fourth Crusade that never makes it to to this to the Holy Land. There's the uh, the German Crusade. And then there's the Fifth Crusade. All of those happened during this timeline, right? So you could you could play a whole campaign just in the Levant if you wanted to, right? But along the Silk Road, there's all this incredible stuff happening. These these different nation states, right? Like the Gurids and the Karakatan and the the Khwarazmian Shahs and and the Liao are all fighting amongst each other for who's going to dominate the Silk Road in those in that period of time. And so there's all kinds of intrigues, warfare. Um, cities shifting in control from one ruler to another. It was a really interesting time for political style RP if you want to do that. Until 
Genghis comes along and he just says, well, you know what? You guys are fighting over this. I'm just going to take it all for myself. And that's basically the apocalypse of the Silk Road at the end of the campaign. Um, you got lists of names by culture, male and female. So you can see Turkic names, Persian names, Karakitan names, uh, Tangut names, Jurchen names, Song Chinese names. Um, so we've got lots and lots of name lists because you want to have – I, I always feel that especially when you're playing in um in a culture that is not your culture, right? Like that, that you want to have credible sounding names, right? Because you can you can just kind of make up names, I guess, if you're playing in a setting that is based like it's basically medieval Europe, right? Um, you can just have people have either generic fantasy names or have um, you know, names that you know, just like, oh, well, this is George from Bristol, you know, <laughs> but, uh, but if you're, you know, like how many of you know what an accurate Tangut name would sound like, right? So it's, it's a good thing to have. It adds more characteristic to the setting. And then you have random ad- encounters and adventure seats. So these are themed on different areas. So you've got things like aristocrats, caravanserais. They're all the, the kind of things, tropes that appear, let's say, in the setting, and they're random tables to develop, they'll develop basically random adventure seeds relating to that theme. So mercenary companies, merchant houses, pleasure houses, uh, which includes rules on opium and hashish and magical drugs, uh, random ruins, scholars and sages, random Sufis, random tribesmen. So this allows you, you know, like random, the random tribesman lets you basically set up a whole tribe of, of uh, you know, uh, nomads in one shot. Same thing with the random village. So that, these are that's kind of the appendix of the book, which is meant to give you a bunch of very easy access tables for you to like uh, at a sudden moment. You know, they're traveling along the road and you, you want them to you want something to happen. You can have those show up. Right. Random ruins, random tribes in a caravan, Sarai. You can have those events or if they're in a city, well, you know, they, they can run into a scholar or a, um, they can run into a mercenary company or something like something like that. Or if they're investigating it, right, or if they tell you it's all out of the out of the blue, you know, as sometimes players do, you know, they're in the city. And they're like, you know, the guy who never, ever showed any interest in in hiring mercenaries up till this moment. And there was no sign in the adventure that he would suddenly says, I'm going to go hire some mercenaries. You need to re- pretty quickly figure out what kind of mercenaries you want him to meet. Well, there you have it in the tables at the back. So that is basically what you get with Sword and Caravan. It's got everything you need to run the campaign. You know, uh, I mean, aside from a core rule set, right? This is not a rule a book. It's a setting book. If you have Lion and Dragon, you run this with Lion and Dragon seamlessly. If you have, but as you saw, there's very little rules material. The only rules material is comes in with the new classes. Everything else is absolutely system neutral, and the rules material that comes in with the classes is OSR compatible. It's the it's you know if you're running Labyrinth Lord, it would be no trouble to convert say the the Silk Road Merchant into a Labyrinth Lord Silk Road Merchant, or even if you didn't, you could literally just have them there and and you know, even have someone play it with the lion and dragon rules. And it wouldn't really make that big of a change from the guy that's the labyrinth Lord guy, you know? Um, so you could be playing, you know, D and D first edition, let's say, and the magic system, you, if you want to keep using the D and D magic system, go ahead. You know, that's fine. You could have, if you really want to, you can have fireballs and stuff like that along the silk road. Right. So that's, that's okay. And then, you know, if you want the sages, because remember, they're sages, they're not wizards, right? So you can have a Chinese wizard that, that casts Fireball too. But then the sages know these other little techniques, which which probably a magician could, could theoretically also know, especially a Chinese one, you know, that give a different flavor of uh, magical quality, right? So why not? You can totally do that. Anyway, so those are, those are the ideas. It's compatible. You can run it with 5e, for example. You can run it with any D&D-based system, and you can use... 95% of it with, say, whatever, you know, um, any other fantasy system you want to, you know, basic role playing or, or, you know, whichever one, you know, if you if you're running Pathfinder or what have you, because it's a system neutral book. So if, if you, you know, you're not a 
Lion and Dragon fan, don't let that stop you from getting Sword and Caravan if Sword and Caravan seems cool to you. And believe me, it is. So far, I haven't had a single criticism about this book. I haven't heard one. I mean, maybe there is one. Somebody wants to share one, go right ahead. But uh, I'm always open to it. And I've ha- heard criticism about some of my other books, but I haven't heard one yet about Sword and Caravan. It's, it's been so well received. So check it out. Take a look. I guess that's everything for today. Um, let me know if you have any questions about Sword and Caravan. You can ask them in the comments. Like this video, share this video, subscribe if you haven't subscribed. And if Sword and Caravan really isn't your thing, take a look at the links in the description of this video because there's links to a whole bunch of other games I've done, some of which might be your thing. You know, And if none of those are your thing, but you like, I don't know, the cut of my jib or you like my politics or whatever and you want to support me anyways, I've also got a Patreon page, <laughs> which you can do there. Um, thank you, by the way, to everyone who's already bought Sword and Caravan. You can get it on PDF or print, soft cover or hard cover on Drive Through RPG. You can also get it on Amazon if you don't want to get it on Drive Through, but you can't get the PDF on Amazon. Amazon, it's print only, soft cover and hard cover. And I think it's also available on Barnes and Noble now too. So, same thing though. The PDF, if you want it, if you want to get the hardcover or softcover plus PDF combo, you got to go to drive through. Okay. And I know that some of you might not like drive through very much, but you know, that's, that's the reality. <laughs> that's, that's where it is. And you know, it's, um, I haven't, I haven't had any problem myself at least. Well, I've, I've had a, a, a few very small problems with drive through a couple of medium ones, maybe, but I haven't had any big problems with drive through. Okay. I, 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 I'm not, uh, I'm not all, happy with their new policies but um i also think that for example with venger as i mentioned in the inappropriate characters video um the other day uh his you know they they haven't banned him and they haven't even banned his book they they they've actually been uh, they made these very hardline policies but then they sounded kind of reasonable when they were talking to him so maybe it's you know uh it's not that bad. I would love if there was more, if there was a variety of places like drive through that could offer what we get from drive through so that we would have alternatives. I would like that. But um, the reality is that drive through is, uh, you know, also, you know, they're, they're publishing for mad scribe games and mad scribe games works on drive through specter press works exclusively on drive through, you know, and uh, that's that's how we've got to go with it. I'm just the writer. Don't blame me. <laughs> OK, <laughs> but uh, but check it out. Check out Sword and Caravan wherever you want to check it out and uh, share the video anywhere you think people might be interested in this or or where it might piss people off. You know, <laughs> I don't know how a review of Sword and Caravan could piss someone off, except I guess it could piss off some of the SJWs when they find out that like in, in one month, this thing did like four times my mortgage payment. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, that's everything for today. Currently smoking uh, Nira Poker plus Argento Natural. <laughs>